Hi, hello, um, everyone. Um, apologies for starting slightly late today. There's some problem with my home internet, but it's all sorted now. Um, my name is Loretta Lowe, so I'll be chairing today's Scientech um, Asia seminar. So it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Paul Jobin, who is um, Associate Research Fellow at the Academia Sinica in Taiwan. He has a PhD in sociology of development from ASSES, the prestigious School of Advanced uh, Studies in Social Science in Paris. Um, Paul's research lie in the areas in industrial disease and environmental activism, environmental justice, and the roles of um, scientific expertise and non-human agents. And he has conducted research on uh, Minamata disease and air pollution and asbestos uh, litigations and nuclear plant workers in Japan. Um, more recently, his work is concerned with the struggle of former RCA workers and residents um, who live near the petrochemical uh, um, plant uh, in Yunnan County in Taiwan. Um, his publication, his most recent one, can be found in East Asian Science, Technology and Society, Environmental Sociology, the Asia Pacific Journal, um, Japan Focus. So, so today, uh, Paul is going to talk about anthropo the Anthropocene and money. So, uh, I think uh, it's such an intri uh, intriguing topic. And without further ado, so I'll, I'll pass the stage to Paul. Um, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, hi, Loretta. Um, thank you very much for this invitation. Also to Gonzalo and Ichen. Ichen, you are in Hong Kong, right? Wait. Yes, yes. Oh, so, and, and Loretta is in Macau and Gonzalo is in Coimbra. Is that right? I'm just, I'm... just, to, just to make sure. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I'm in Coimbra, okay. it's done in Hong Kong, Loretta in London. Yeah, but, but I'm currently based in, in Vienna. So, so um, I'm, oh, I'm from see. Hong Kong, but then I'm based in Vienna right now. In Vienna, oh, I see, okay. So um, maybe I start with PowerPoint. Okay, can you see can you see my slides? Yes, very clearly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So uh, when Loretta invited me for this seminar, I was wondering what where to start. And uh, actually, recently I have a couple of. Uh, uh, journal articles and uh, also forthcoming book. And uh, given the, that uh, most of you are in STS, uh, I found that it would be interesting to share those uh, uh, recent publication from an STS angle. One of these articles is, was published in uh, STS journal, but uh, the other two not, not, but I think we can bring the STS perspective on, on, on those. So it will be a kind of uh, three in one, like uh, you know when you have the shampoo, the conditioner, and the body soap all in one product. Um, so I hope it won't be too too compact and too condensed. And uh, I have to watch time. So sh shall I try to spo to speak until uh, now? It's eight ten in in Taipei. I will try to stop around nine o'clock, so we have enough time for the Q&A. What do you think, Gonzalo, Loretta? That's perfect. Michel? Thank you. Will be fine? Okay, so let me start. So the topic is about money and the Anthropocene. Um, you already have uh, uh, several fascinating lectures in this, uh, in another series of lecture, <coughs> which you call Pluralizing the Anthropocene. I like very much the title and I was thrilled by the presentations by many uh, prominent scholars like uh, uh, Timothy Ingold and Anna Ting and it was very fascinating. So I think I don't have um, 
too much to say about the Anthropocene. I think most of you know about the notion and where it comes from and, and much of the debate about. I just would like to um, mention uh, something which is a debate now in, in, in some countries in, in Asia. It's the, um, there is a post-colonial criticism of Western dimension of this notion. Uh, there's not much, but a, a couple of our journal articles um, or book chapters emphasizing that uh, so far the Anthropocene uh, remains mostly uh, a Western notion in the sense that uh, most of the scholars writing on the Anthropocene are from either Western Europe, United States, Canada, Australia, um, but very few are Asian scholars are, and if they are, they will uh, write in, in English for the few articles. There's a, a few articles about, for example, India or Indonesia, but, and I think I found one about Philippines, but very little production regarding addressing the problem, the specificities of how, of the Anthropocene when looking at the, at Asia. For example, their article looking at, uh, uh, for, for sure, the, 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 sh the growing share of the, the fact that China and India have, have become the uh, biggest uh, global emitters for carbon emissions, uh, or but the destruction of the South Sea Station forest, this kind of topic, but mostly in English. And there's a very little academic production in Asian languages. So for example, I put some uh, um, in Bahasa Indonesia or in Japanese or Chinese, but very little. So um, um, the collective book I'm about to publish, uh, I, sh I think it should be I'm checking the index now. So I hope it can be published next month at, in Singapore by ICAS. Um, is a collective book um, um, about environmental movement and politics in what we call the Asian Anthropocene. The Anthropocene should not be uh, specified to one continent, but uh, here we emphasize that uh, there's some Asian dimensions for it. So it's, um, I briefly introduce it, it's um, a collection of uh, 11 chapters, um, in the introduction, I, I discussed, uh, we discussed with my colleagues the, why the Asian Anthrop the Anthropocene has not been very popular among Asian scholars so far. And what does it mean for the sociology and the politics of environmental movements? So here we, we, had, hesitate, we have hesitated to use uh, the notion of environmental movements because one problem with this notion of environment is it, tend, it tends to relegate ecology and uh, the problem of related to industrial pollution and all this global climate, global heating, all this um, big issue of which now the are can be catch up by the notion of Anthropocene. Uh, the environment, the notion of environment, tends to relegate those problems, those huge uh, epoch problems into the environs. In French, environ means the, the, the merges, the, the, the peripheries of, of a problem. While the, the very problem at issue is how to bring back environmental issues at the core of politics and also geopolitics. Um, here I'm thinking, for example, there is a, one of a chapter, um, a chapter on Cambodia is um, addresses the, problem of uh, Chinese investment in Cambodia, and uh, the, 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 the lot of uh, programs of development for dams, which have been uh, uh, tremendous consequences for the Mekong uh, River and all, all, all the region. So here, geopolitics entangled with national politics and with environmental politics. So the very problem is how to bring back nation and democracy back into uh, at the core of uh, how to address uh, the Anthropocene from a grassroots perspective and which is uh, specified to the, uh, the, the context of Asia. 
And uh, the conclusion uh, is uh, I tried to compare, uh, I use different index re regarding democracy and, uh, and um, um, there's a couple of index about, uh, you know, democracy like uh, Freedom House uh, indexes about the level of democracy in which in several countries, in, in all countries. And there's another couple of index uh, of, about environmental performances. So I tried to compare how this, uh, uh, the, the two kind of in, uh, indexes um, are integral to one another, and here is the major issue: is how to rebuke the, you know, the, for, during the last decade there's been a trend for pushing um, um, the notion of environmental authoritarianism has become more and more trendy with with China and Singapore as uh, as models. So here I try to address this problem. So uh, another criticism of the notion of Anthropocene has, has been about uh, its lack uh, of uh, criticism on capitalism or its lack of interest on capitalism. So uh, uh, the notion of capitalocene, capitalocene uh, aims to fix that problem, but uh, well, still the, the notion of uh, Anthropocene is more popular. Actually, there's so many, so many alternative uh, notions for the Anthropocene, but still the Anthropocene remains the most popular. So it's, it's uh, more uh, convenient uh, for us to use this word, I think. Even uh, Jason Moore, historian Jason Moore was, was uh, pushed forward to, uh, Introduced the notion of capitalism uh, um, agrees with that. Uh, we, Anthropocene is still helpful. <laughs> Moore uh, emphasized the, that the exploitation and reliance on cheap nature, what he called cheap na nature, is the fundamental capitalist law of value. And uh, someone else has mentioned that uh, actually it's perhaps easier to get rid of capitalism. Uh, than to stop global heating. Um, oh, no, sorry, it's the contrary. <laughs> I made a mistake. Uh, it's easy, it might be easier to stop global re uh, heating rather than uh, stopping capitalism. Sorry, I made a mistake. That's <laughs> and um, um, there's a, we have seen uh, the development of green finance uh, or um, Equator principles, you know, to put, put pressure on banks to. Uh, canalize uh, in investments to put pressure on banks so that they do not finance uh, uh, big polluters or uh, um, or programs of corporate social responsibility. These sorts of things are attend to uh, make a combination of capitalism and uh, well, they don't want to, to say uh, not to throw uh, the baby with the water of the bath, but uh, mm, sometimes you can wonder if these programs, maybe they are just kind of greenwashing. Now, um, I come to the problem of money in the Anthropocene. And here I, I follow mainly on a book which was published uh, two years ago by Harf Hornborg, um, Danish anthropologist. Um, Ornborg follows on a lot of works in anthropology and eco um, economic anthropology, de dealing with what he called general purpose money. Um, he, but uh, he introduced difference between um, general purpose money like dollar or yuan or yen or whatever, with uh, what he calls locally embedded money. Uh, this can be a, a social system of exchange. And um, he, he sees in induced locally embedded money an alternative um, for a complementary currency that could contain the massive waste of materials and fossil energy generated by international trade and long range transport. That's an interesting, uh, very uh, challenging and stimulating um, proposition. But yet, um, it's still difficult to see uh, when we will be able to 
uh, develop those uh, local system of money to such an extent that it can really um, make a big shift in the economy. So it's a, I think it's a, it's a project for a, a long term. The problem is that we know that you, the Anthropocene means also the a big acceleration. We don't have much time to cope with uh, climate change or in global heating. And um, I'm afraid to do so. Uh, local system of money would, would not make um, a significant enough change in time for what is at issue now in terms of, of time. I mean, if we want to um, limit the global warming before, um, below 2 or 1.5 degrees. Now, in my presentation today for the remaining time, I would like to introduce uh, two cases I have been studied in Taiwan. Um, so although those cases might look more parochial compared to uh, you know, this big issue uh, called the Anthropocene, um, I think it's um, the idea is um, to bring back the problem at both um, in more concrete terms and also uh, to um, work anew, to look anew how uh, money is at uh, uh, is um, really functioning in daily time in uh, issues of industrial pollution, which can be con considered as Anthropocene, uh, the daily routine of Anthropocene, if if I can put put things like this. But uh, so here the main problem is. Uh, uh, what we call compensation, Beijing in Chinese. And uh, for Hamburg, uh, it totally rejects the notion of compensation as totally um, unfit uh, for uh, addressing the problem of the Anthropocene, considering that is, it is compensation is based on an, an essentialist conception of value that creates the belief that exchange values have or should have an analytically specifiable relation to some objective material substratum of reality. So um, here, I would like to try to consider if we can nevertheless look for a fair price of compensation as an a reachable ideal or as a solution to uh, a gradual solution to the Anthropocene. Um, now, um, I have a problem with money. I think many uh, left-wing liberal thinkers have a problem with money, especially uh, um, when I consider my French Catholic background. I mean, Catholic especially a big problem with money. I always feel guilty when they have or sorry when they don't have. Anyway, um, that's a <laughs> researcher's problem. But, um, um, when we look at environmental mobilization, uh, we find of, of, uh, that um, many times uh, corporate money drives mobilization into key sense. It's a way for corporation, for big uh, companies to uh, make uh, environmental protests quiet. And uh, when people accept, uh, for example, fence line communities exposed to uh, air pollution, if they accept uh, some kind of compensation. They might follow in what uh, Van Rooij and, uh, and uh, scholars, um, Alice Ma and, and uh, have uh, called the, the compensation trap, meaning that you accept and once you are in, you it's very difficult to get rid of it. And this in this process, people might get stigmatized by accepting money. Like um, this is something I, I, I have heard many times when I discuss about my research, uh, like uh, comments even from uh, educated people who say, oh, you know, those people, what they just want money. Um, okay, could be, but could be not. Um, so here we have uh, in the ecological economics, in the um, subfield of economics called ecological economics, um, I've introduced some interesting notion of languages of valuation. And this um, literature emphasized the incommensurability of environmental damage. So this 
So, but this research altogether um, tend to emphasize that, um, um, I mean, it's not clearly stipulated like this, but it's my, my understanding from a circular level that there is a kind of romantic view of mobilization and, um, and, and as if money was always bad, whatever. Um, another range of research now in the SDS uh, uh, literature is um, uh, focused on um, the uh, booming sector of genomics and recombinant DNA, uh, booming from uh, which has developed very fast from fastly from the 1970s. Um, according to uh, Sander Ryan, who have published a fascinating book about, about it. Uh, those technologies concern life itself, and uh, they can be seen as, as uh, a way to transform genetics into data that can be patented, stored, and traded. So um, this economy, um, this capitalism, this um, Sander Ryan uh, used the notion of biocapitalism uh, following on um, Foucault. Uh, this biocapitalism um, is based on the surplus value of life. Of course, it, it's also uh, an exploitation of labor, but it's mainly a, a, a valuation of life in itself. And the goal is to change life into a business plan. So, uh, you know, using genomics as a way to promise uh, uh, a great life, you, 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 you won't get old, you won't get sick, uh, so it's uh, um, another singing paradise. Well, a lot of industry have always been selling all kinds of magic and, and, and like think of asbestos, for example. They, they have sell asbestos for decades as the magic product. So it's not new, this marketing of, 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 uh, of life. But um, what is uh, the problem is that this, this business has developed a huge focus on uh, emphasize the importance of genetics against other risk factors like environmental pollution or occupational injuries. Uh, Michel Murphy has uh, followed on Michel Calon to uh, introduce, uh, she, she, follow, she uses so a, a notion of neo biocapitalism, but she prefers to uh, use biopolitics, but never mind. She's um, use the notion of economization of life um, to emphasize that categories of more and less worthy of living, reproducing and being human. Some categories are more worthy of living than other. It means that uh, there is a brutal repartition between investable lives, avertable lives and expendable lives. She's, this, this is based on her research in Bangladesh on population data. Now, I follow another, another, another range of uh, literature, which is uh, we can call the sociology of money, which has been, uh, well, it's, there is a long tradition uh, starting from, uh, from Marx and um, Zimmel and um, and um, uh, more recently, uh, the work of uh, historian Viviana Zelitzer, and in particular, her famous book called The Social Meaning of Money. So what, what she means by social meaning of money is that, uh, and here she talks about general purpose money. It's, it's not local money, it's like dollars or whatever. But uh, even with dollars, you can, there is a, uh, so many practices of uh, earmarking money, meaning that uh, once, of, for example, you will, you will not mix the money that you earn from your a regular job, or if uh, a prostitute, for example, will not use the money she earns as a prostitute for the um, education of her child. She will make different boxes of money, even with cash. These sort of practices, are called the earmarking, and this entails different meanings of 
different sum of money, depending on the origin. In China, some uh, interesting research uh, following on, on the litter, I found that uh, there is uh, what the author called the price of blood in criminal reconciliation, it's a special procedure in China. Or uh, um, an English uh, um, legal scholar have found, have um, made an interesting analysis of a case in Ecuador about a um, case of pollution caused by BP in Ecuador. And uh, uh, talking about a court decision, yeah, he introduced the notion of the price of an apology that uh, even in civil court, in civil actions, uh, there's some kind of money that can have a symbolic importance that means uh, an apology for, for, the, for the plaintiffs and victims. In the context of Taiwan and China, you know that uh, um, there are so many uh, meanings for uh, on money depending on the occasion. For example, for, um, for the wedding, for wedding, we will offer red envelopes, and for uh, um, during for funerals, we will offer white envelopes. Um, this, well, personally, the first time I experienced that was in Japan, and uh, that was quite shocking for me. <laughs> and so it means the different uh, uh, continent, uh, different practices of money. So, and this, um, and not so much, but um, uh, um, some um, interesting uh, work in anthropology of, of money about uh, the symbolic graduation to repair an offense. Uh, here I'm following on the work of a Taiwanese colleague uh, who has uh, studied uh, the case of Solomon Island. Now, in uh, the remaining time, um, I would like to introduce uh, two cases i have been studied here in Taiwan and Loretta has kindly introduced. You know. uh, one is about uh, Taiwan RCA, it's an uh, electronic company, and the other one is uh, a petrochemical uh, company. And uh, well, I mostly, um, the case of RCA, I've been, um, my first contact with this case was uh, 20 years ago, in 1998, I was um, a PhD student at that time, and um, and uh, I was introduced to that case uh, because the victims had uh, launched, uh, um, have started a mobilization for for to get uh, uh, compensated. Um, and the other case is in uh, a, a huge petrochemical plant, um, a Taiwanese company. And in both cases, um, I've been uh, do, conducting uh, participating observation, meaning that uh, I, for, for example, in the case of Taiwan RCA, I've been a member uh, for the last 10 years, I've been a member of the consultant group of, for the plaintiffs. So it means I attend uh, regularly the meetings with the plaintiffs and their lawyers and uh, um, a few other um, scholars um, participate in that. Uh, in the consulting groups. And uh, beside that, this participating observation in, in meetings or court, court hearings, um, I've also conducted uh, in-depth interviews with uh, um, some plaintiffs, depending on the priorities of the mobilization and my research at that time. For, um, so for example, in this, in this case, I was interested by understanding more how the, the plaintiffs uh, um, were motivated to get compensated and how they perceive the, the compensation. A third case, I won't have time to talk about it, but it's another case which is also related to Formosa plastic, but it is in Vietnam. It's a case of marine pollution that has been caused by a steel mill that uh, um, Formosa plastic has created as developed in, in Vietnam. And the case was, uh, case it was a huge marine pollution in 2016. And because in Vietnam, the, um, the victims tried to go to the court, but there is a lack of independence, uh, independent justice. 
So with the help of Taiwanese uh, NGOs, or as well as uh, US and Canadian lawyers, uh, they have launched a lawsuit uh, in Taiwan. It's a very interesting case of uh, transnational um, advocacy movement. And um, the case includes 7,000 plaintiffs. Um, and uh, he also they seek uh, compensation for the, for the damage. Okay, so I start with uh, Taiwan RCA. Can I just check with Loretta and Gonzalo if my voice is okay or can you hear me fine? Very well. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> and I apologize for my English. Sometimes it's, it's broken French English. Okay. Um, it's a long story, so like, I will be very brief. Uh, Tai, um, Taiwan RCA is so it's um, RCA is an American company, Radio Corporation of America, launched uh, TV set uh, factories in Taiwan in 1968. And in 1992, um, the factories closed. Uh, the company went to China for cheaper, la cheap, cheaper labor. But soon after the company closed, uh, it was found a massive uh, groundwater pollution and little by little the former workers most of them female workers found out that they were uh, struck with all kind of cancers so in 1998 they launched a self-help association that was the beginning of their mobilization in 2004 they had launched uh, they started uh, the first lawsuit but uh, and it was not until 2009 that uh, they would have the first court hearings. Um, the, the, the first lawsuit was started with uh, around 500 plaintiffs. And it was not until 2015 that they had the first decision from the district court of Taipei. Uh, some plaintiffs were rejected, but most of them were uh, confirmed in their um, a request for uh, compensation. And uh, the judges found that uh, uh, four toxicants were involved in the pollution. And the uh, compensation amount was uh, 500 million, uh, 5.600 million uh, Taiwan dollar, about 18 US dollar, 18 million US dollar. Uh, so thanks to this victory, uh, there was another group of plaintiffs which started uh, a second lawsuit. Now, so we have uh, the, the, the two cases are still pending in the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. Um, the second decision uh, from the Court of Appeal in 2017 was very good for the plaintiffs. More plaintiffs were recognized by the judges. Uh, also, the judges understood a larger um, uh, that the toxicant issue was a, a cocktail of toxicants, and no, no less than 31 toxicants. And also the compensation were uh, slightly uh, increased. But in the last decision from the Supreme Court, uh, half of the plaintiffs were sent back to the, to the appeal because they could not prove causality between their um, exposure to the toxicants and, and their uh, health status. Um, in the first group, the, the 2,262 plaintiffs who were recognized had cancers, while the other group of plaintiffs had all kinds of health problems, but not cancers. So the judge found the causality was not uh, clear enough. So we, um, now we have, just today we had a, a hearing in, in the court um, the case is still pending and, and the battle goes on, but uh, yeah, it gives you an idea of the long time of, of these kind of issues. Um, now, about money, how, 
the plaintiff's, uh, the plaintiff's perception of money depends on, on these uh, different court decisions, the content of the court decisions. For example, at the, the, after the decision of the Court of Appeal in 2017, the plaintiffs were very happy with the decision. Um, but they were discontent with the low amounts of compensation. Um, on the second, uh, on the first, uh, well, the second decision, but uh, the first decision for the second group of plaintiffs in the district courts, uh, the, the compensation has, has been, uh, um, uh, oh no, sorry, that was in Supreme Court. At the Supreme Court, um, they were both angry for the, the fact that uh, many, uh, half of the plaintiffs were not recognized and the, the compensation amount was decreased. But uh, the plaintiffs were more happy at the district court decision uh, two years ago uh, for the second group of plaintiffs because the, the, the compensation amount has been increased and uh, uh, the content of the, of, the, from, uh, of the decision from a legal perspective was also very good. So, you know, it depends on, on the, court, the content of the court decision. Another uh, standard of comparison is the, the amount of compensation requested by the plaintiffs. Uh, there are several groups of plaintiffs, depending if the plaintiff, uh, if they are deceased parents or a plaintiff with cancer or those with less severe sicknesses. Now, people also compare with other countries. So, for example, this reaction, um, I found that on, on was on the social uh, website after the decision in 2017. Um, one Taiwanese found that, you know, uh, the life of Taiwanese is not, uh, is not worth something compared to the US. Well, actually, If we make comparison with the, with other countries like Japan, um, Taiwan is is about in the same range of of, of compensation amounts. Um, difference come with uh, uh, when we compare with countries like Australia, uh, it's much lower, or USA. For example, in USA, for just one case. Uh, in uh, two years ago, in the case of, against uh, Walker, a uh, groundskeeper who, who, who was found with cancer and after using a lot of Roundup, Monsanto's herbicide, uh, was uh, the, 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 the court uh, decided a, a huge amount, like 250 million. It's, it's a thousand times the, the Amount for the, the whole plaintiffs in Taiwan. Um, but of course, the company will appeal. So this uh, amount was, uh, was reduced. But still, it's, it's still 20 times more compared to, to, to Taiwan. So uh, indeed, here we have, a, we have a problem when we go into uh, international comparison. And since we are dealing with global capitalism, this is, of course, um, um, an issue here. And the plaintiffs compare also with what the defendants spend in with their lawyers and the experts. For example, this professor from Harvard University uh, admitted to the court that he uh, was given like $750 per hour um, just and came all the way to Taiwan. So, so of course the plaintiffs made a calculation and realize how much money the company prefers to pay to their lawyers and experts instead of, of paying compensation. So I made uh, some uh, uh, in interviews with, uh, in-depth interviews with, with a group of plaintiffs um, and I followed on a questionnaire inspired by the work of Zelitzer to try to understand how the plaintiffs perceive that money uh, the compensation amount decided by the judge to go more into the details of the perception and what would they do with that money if provided they could get that money. And uh, 
my assistant and I, we, we, we were very surprised by the sometimes very emotional tone of, uh, of uh, those interviews. Um, it's surprising how people are, um, in Taiwan, it's, it's quite easy to speak about health problem. But when we go into money, uh, we were surprised that how emotional these uh, uh, lawyer, these uh, workers could become. Some emphasize apologies and stressing that what they want from the defendants is that they recognize that they have faulted. Um, so some, some plaintiffs emphasize on apology. Um, others emphasize solidarity and the need for transmission to other workers in similar case or other workers in the futures, even including uh, former RCA workers. So here they look at, for example, Superfund in the US. So here is the problem of memory, how to transmit memory of the case to the future generation. Um, so I make a uh, distinction between what I call the symbolic order of valuation, which emphasize uh, apology and uh, the other order of um, valuation, which I call economic order of valuation, which will emphasize on compensation. And I look into court decision, but also out of court settlement in the case uh, we can have uh, out of court settlement. And uh, I would put solutions like a memorial for workers, a fund for future victims at the corner in between the search for a symbolic valuation and economic valuation. I think it's a mix, it's kind of, uh, uh, of mixed solution. But money necessarily interwins with uh, symbolic symbolism as emphasized the work of Zelizer and I, I, I confirmed that in my research that, uh, um, for example, of course we want apologies, but I won't accept apologies if that means they can't get away with two, with two words of formal apology. It's, uh, they don't want that apology means a lip service. So this is where money will entangle with, uh, with, um, with uh, apology. Like uh, I heard that uh, uh, some plaintiffs saying that, uh, you know, uh, if the amount of compensation is too low, it will just add insult to injury. Of course, plaintiffs also make comparison between one another. So uh, you can't help this. Is, and and uh, not, it doesn't mean necessarily jealousy, but they of, of course made comparison and between their health status and the other plaintiffs. And oh, if this one received more money, although my health status is, is more uh, complicated than his or this sort of comparison. So um, between the symbolic order of valuation and economic order, we can find that uh, uh, there is a room for uh, the price of an apology uh, because they want an apology, uh, but they also want compensation in the sense that, uh, so the, 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 the combination of that means that in Chinese it's a chen zhu shi dao chen, money is, is Apology. It's maybe it's something that uh, um, I think, um, for example, in France, people would not uh, stipulate things like this. I think maybe this is this, there is a, also an influence of the cultural uh, context. Now, another problem is uh, the time bomb, in the sense that uh, the workers have been exposed to toxicants decades ago. Now, uh, it's, it's a time bomb in a sense that they never know what kind of problems it will, it will cause. If they don't have cancer yet, they see their colleagues dying of cancer one after the, the other. So they think of themselves, okay, maybe I'm, I'm next on the list. And the next problem is for the 
for the second gener or third generation. Like uh, I met with two, uh, two of my interviewees uh, had uh, um, themselves had uh, ovarian cancer, uh, but they found that their daughters or granddaughters had uh, problems like chocolate kist, which is an ovarian kist that caused uh, a lot of um, trouble. And um, this was perceived as a time bomb because uh, as if their own body was the pollution will not stop with their own body. It, it's, it's a kind of never ending problem. So here we have also to think about how we can, uh, if I were to put uh, the time, this time bomb somewhere, I would also put it in between, you know, a mix between apology and compensation. But I think this is worth, uh, this is worth a compensation. Unfortunately, so far in the, this, the um, at court, uh, it is the, this time bomb which is uh, which has received the less attention from the judge, and uh, hence the decision of the judge of the court of appeal to send uh, of the supreme court to send back half of the plaintiff back to the court of appeal. This is the problem we have. Um, okay, so. Now we go in the second case. I hope it's not too much information. So Formosa Plastic is uh, one of the biggest uh, companies in, in, in industries in Taiwan. And uh, um, this is the sixth NAFTA petrochemical zone. It's in the center of Taiwan, uh, southwestern Taiwan. And it is one of the biggest uh, petrochemical zones in Asia. Um, and uh, according to some uh, um, uh, estimates, it uh, accounts for 10% of Taiwan GDP. So it's, it has, of course, a huge uh, influence on Taiwan economy and politics. And Formosa Plastic has uh, uh, factories around the world, in China, also in Vietnam, in uh, in the US. In Texas, two years ago, there was um, and there was also a case of uh, environmental pollution. And, and the judge has found, uh, uh, as described Formosa plastic as a serial offender, uh, meaning it is a persistent polluter, which ignores the laws, uh, which is not the regulation on air pollution, water pollution, uh, whatever. They just keep on uh, polluting. So it's record for environmental protection, uh, really not good. Here, this is a case of uh, the lawsuit is, uh, was launched by uh, um, about uh, 75 plaintiffs um, who live on the fence line uh, of uh, the, the petrochemical zone. Mostly, the um, um, half of them uh, have uh, lung disease or liver disease, mostly cancer. The um, leading uh, leader of the plaintiffs group, uh, lawyers, uh, is uh, Thomas Chan, is, uh, has been nominated as the Environmental Protection Administration uh, Deputy Minister in 2016. So for two years, he could not attend the court hearings. But, uh, but despite of this, uh, well, what you could say, uh, uh, political, uh, potential political influence, uh, um, and despite repeated environmental violations from the company, um, despite copious scientific evidence, I mean, here we have the top of the top, uh, epidemiologists um, have been working on the case for the last 10 years. They have produced uh, more than 10 uh, journal articles published in the best uh, journals for epidemiology and air pollution. And despite all this uh, uh, very uh, solid research on the impact of air pollution um, in the consequence in terms of concerts for the for the fence line communities. Uh, the defendant lawyers 
uh, continue to argue that uh, EPA reports on the case don't prove any causality, uh, that uh, we should not use general but specific causation. In other words, uh, they deny that this case is a case of industrial pollution. It's a little bit, uh, because in Chinese it's gonghai. Gonghai is a translation for public uh, nuisances, uh, but um, it's, uh, it means that uh, it's not a matter of public health, but it's a, it's a problem of, you know, uh, individual uh, health status because perhaps this uh, um, family is uh, uh, it's too much. Uh, um, well, smoking can be an excuse, or maybe uh, all kind of the, the uh, kind of food they eat. Or the, they will try to individual individualize the the, the causation. Another excuse they found to uh, deny the case um, is uh, they ask the defend uh, the plaintiff's lawyers to prove what chemicals come from each chimney. I mean, from each company, each plant in the petrochemical complex. Uh, so to prove the links with with the plaintiff's illness, it's 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 kind of crazy. We have never seen this sort of discussion in, in the courts for a, a case of industrial pollution. So but the judge is uh, some, we have now very good judges in, in Taiwan, but in some cases, the judge are kind of lazy. I think this is the old generation. And this, uh, this judge is, he, he just wants the expert that will come to decide for him uh, if uh, um, in the end, is there any uh, causality between air pollution, this air massive, reject of air pollutants from Formosa plastic zone and the cancers of the plaintiffs. Now, regarding money, interestingly, the defendant's lawyer has repeatedly mentioned that uh, if the plaintiffs need financial help, the companies can help with their good neighbor policies. I have translated good neighbor policies. It's a uh, common term in English in the US or other countries where uh, this sort of corporate uh, good behavior is, is uh, uh, like to uh, call itself like good neighbor policies. In Chinese, it's the dun ching wuling. It's a verb. It's, uh, you can do dun ching wuling. It means that you, you will be a good neighbor. You will be good, good neighboring. You will practice good neighboring, and this is and you you show good neighboring through all kind of money. I'll be back on that. Uh, so to understand how these uh, the plaintiffs would perceive that that kind of offer, I have conducted interviews uh, with uh, uh, the, the families of plaintiffs. Now I found a, a difference. Uh, my first question was, but why all the plaintiffs are, although we have several um, fence line communities, um, all the plaintiffs come from, oh, sorry, it's in Chinese, it's uh, Taisi, uh, it's in the one community, while the, the other community in Mailiao, this community, is um, uh, there is no plaintiff. So there's some historical rules for that. I won't go into the details, but more recently, I found that uh, uh, Formosa Plastic has in, uh, launched a different regime of compensation, depending on the behavior, the attitude of one community compared to the other. So in Mailia, the population is growing, while Taisi has been economically devastated by the lack of investment. In Mailia, they have received an hospital from Formosa Plastic. Uh, the residents benefit from care for the elderly, lunch boxes for the school children, etc. And a small thing, but in Mailia, people receive a monthly allowance of 600 Taiwan dollars. It's very little, only 20. US dollar per capita. But in Taisin and the other uh, fence line community of Suhu, people only receive 100 uh, Taiwan dollar, only three, three bucks a month, which is, well, in any case, uh, three bucks or 20 bucks, that doesn't make maybe a big difference for us. But for these people, 
um, even these amounts are modest. I, I was surprised at how they, 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 they see in this, in this difference uh, an unfair discrimination. And this feeling is so strong that it will influence the perception, their perception of the damage. Like I heard uh, um, comments like, the north wind brings us all the bads in, in Taisi, in the community of Taisi, they would say, the north wind coming from the zone bring us all the bad, but for Milo, uh, they are not exposed to pollution, like which, which is, uh, I mean, it's, it's obviously not the case. I mean, and, and we have uh, uh, proofs from that with, with uh, research on air pollution. But this is this perception is is changed by uh, the di distribution of money. What they share in common are narratives of risk, like about this bad smell or, and um, um, many uh, have. Um, families or friends working in the, in the petrochemical zone that will inform them of oh, tonight you better close the window, you know, because we are going to release uh, uh, some bad toxicants in the air. Or they don't dare to drink the water. And they see uh, all, um, the seawater is, is polluted with uh, oil on the surface, this kind of place. So this is, this make a shared narratives of, of risk. And they have a shared experience of damage. Um, First, the fish and seafood uh, died, uh, or, or they, they can't grow, uh, or they have bad smell or wet colors. The fruits and vegetables don't grow either, and cancers. Last but not least, explosions, and very regularly. Um, thanks to this explosion, I had the opportunity to uh, interview uh, factory workers. I have been trying hard for the last five years to, to interview workers, but because of the secrecy policy in the plant, it was very difficult. Not until the, the first explosion of, uh, the explosion of uh, April 2019, uh, with some workers uh, agreed to talk uh, about um, the internal corruption, losing state control, this kind of problems. And, uh, no, last one is uh, also we have uh, a lot of occupational injuries, but I realized that uh, um, there is kind of unwritten rule that uh, workers cannot declare injuries. Otherwise, they could not. Most of them are contract workers, so if they declare an injury, they will not be um, um, rehired, uh, reemployed on on the zone. And the concerns. So here we have, uh, I follow on the great work of uh, um, Anna Laura Renwhite on China, what she has called a transformation of the moral economy of cancer. He also in Taiwan, although the, 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 the different configuration, but uh, what I find in common with, with uh, uh, what observe Anna in China is that uh, um, there is a, cancer used to be perceive as you know a personal fault what in, uh, in Chinese uh, go gong de. oh sorry uh, no gong de means that you have you have cancer because you have you have done something wrong but now it's it's most in these fence slide communities it's just the most common way of dying so um yeah it's it's a huge transformation of the moral economy of cancer for those with no or less economic pressure, um, they would say, well, I don't care for compensation money. Uh, you don't pay money for your mothers. But many people are under economic pressure. For those people, um, they would say, well, you know, uh, um, we, my, my husband has cancer, so he cannot work anymore. So we really need, we badly need that money. But someone, some uh, uh, farmers who um, uh, had uh, an oyster farm told me this, uh, this was Taiwanese, uh, but how about people? That's like, it means like factories pay reimbursement for oysters, but if people die, it doesn't count. There is no compensation. So here we have an um, interesting reaction of how we discuss. Um, another interesting way of putting things, but uh, um, 
This was a comment from uh, uh, the head of uh, um, a farmers union. Uh, he, had, he said, we don't want Formosa plastic consolation money. What we want from them is not com consolation, is compensation uh, because they have faulted. So here they make a difference between, you know, uh, maybe the same amount of money, but if you call it Puchang in Chinese, it, it's, they won't accept because it, it rejects the, the fault. Let me pass on this and to sum up. Um, so the plaintiff don't want to mix uh, cancers and oysters. They don't want to mix compensation and consolation or compensation and good neighbor programs, good neighbor policies, because good neighbor policies or consolation reject responsibility for the effect of chronic industrial pollution. And uh, which is something that disregards the symbolic and moral meanings of money. So in my uh, good neighbor article, I, I have uh, um, made a typology of those different meaning of money in, in cases of industrial damage. Um, for example, I compare uh, um, uh, cases of uh, what, what is called in the US punitive damages, um, which can be in a way compared uh, to uh, what we call compensation in, in Taiwan or Japan. Um, and for each case, I, I kind of look at what is the moral con connotation of each kind of money. I mean, uh, compensation and fines and good neighbor policies don't have the same moral connotation. Right? And what is the main goal in it? when we think, when you think of the goal of compensation, what is it proposed? What, what, what is it to frame for? And uh, so I try to, uh, clarify uh, how people usually understand uh, those different categories of monies. And uh, I read some example. Okay, so I think um, about the time. Um, sorry, I don't have a conclusion because <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a three in one presentation, but uh, well, mostly two in one. Um, I'm still looking for a conclusion. I, I hope I can get some insight from our discussion that will um, help me to uh, redefine money in the Anthropocene from uh, those uh, two cases. Uh, I hope it's 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 uh, it's at least the, the information I provided here would be enough for uh, for uh, for our discussion uh, on, on and we can go back on the, the what I mean by the specific meanings of money in the context of Asia, of, of, in the specific context of Asia, and how it can address the, the, the global issue of the Anthropocene. Uh, thank you for our attention. Muito obrigado. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, I was... Uh... I was like really intrigued by the last table that you made, and I wish you could we could spend more time on it. But I guess uh, we'll leave that for Q and A. Um, so now is the Q and A session, and we aim to finish at uh, thirty past or thirty five past. Um, so if you you would like to ask a question, um, you may use the raise hand function, or uh, use the raise hand function or use the chat box to tell me that you would like to ask a question and I'll invite you to unmute or you can type your question in the chat box. So um, I'll give the audience some time to organize their thought and as the moderator, I'll take the advantages to have a conversation um, with you, Paul, and ask you some questions. Sorry for coming up a little bit late today. <laughs> There's some some serious problems with the internet in my home. So I will, I find the, the apology and the compensation thing like really interesting, like the, the circle that you draw. So actually, like you've mentioned that like maybe there's is a cultural difference that like in some cultures it's more acceptable to, you know, give out money and in, in others it's not. But like the first thing that came to my mind was that actually it's, in many cases that I can think of, obviously my experience is limited. Um, an apology, even in the West, is often uh, expressed 
in the form of or along with some sort of material material form. So it's not necessarily money. So for example, like we heard that uh, interview from Megan and she said that Kate bought her flowers as an apology. So even though the, the apology is not necessarily in the form of money, it's always um, uh, shown or expressed in some sort of material form. So I think as anthropologists, what really uh, get me thinking is in what cases can we think of some cases when an apology cannot be compensated or is it's immoral to be compensated with some sort of material forms that material forms what I'm talking about is not necessarily money I mean money I think is a little bit more tricky like you say some cultures may find it more acceptable others don't but material form I think is very common so I, I would like to maybe start the discussions from apology and compensation and the form, the material form of the compensation. Like, do you have anything to add? Yes, thank you, Loretta. Um, maybe I, I can share again one slide. Um, I think we're on here. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. So um, I think I mentioned about this possible, uh, or maybe uh, quickly. Uh, here we have a, a, an example of a material form of apology um, uh, in the shape of a memorial for workers. In the case of RCA, um, the idea, the initial idea of the of the plaintiffs and the worker, the former workers would would be was to um, build a memorial for the workers in the former place of the factory. Now it's the factory has been um, um, dismantled, um, but um, the land is there. It's still polluted, and it, the the, um, uh, the the pollution is is ongoing. Um, and that was one, one uh, possibility. Another possibility would be if they, we can't, but still it means we will have to buy, they would have to buy the land. And uh, although it's polluted, it's still uh, a lot of money because it's in center of Taoyuan, which is not far from the airport, international airport. So it's, there's some value for, for the land, but uh, so it's it's maybe difficult for, for still, you know, even <laughs> when you go into a material a form of apology, it's still, it has a price. It's, it's difficult to, the only thing that uh, doesn't need a price is a speech like, I'm sorry, I did something wrong to you. And, uh, um, now I'm tempted to talk about the out, out of court settlement. <laughs> I'm not supposed to talk about it, but how can I, you know, because we signed a, um, how can I put that? Uh, but okay, the defendant's lawyers, in the case of RCA, the defendant lawyers made it clear that in no way they could accept. Uh, to apologize in a way that we have been wrong, we have made so, uh, yeah, I, perhaps I forgot to mention how bad they were because for decades they polluted on, almost, not on purpose, but it was a, a gross, gross negligence that they had, for example, the managers would drink bottled water what, while they would, they, they knew that because they knew that the, the groundwater were, were polluted with a lot of toxicants like benzene, trichloroethylene, and so on and so forth. So the workers were daily exposed by to, to these toxicants in, in the shop floor because they were because of the air pollution, uh, lack of aeration system. Uh, and then in the dormitories, they would drink that water, they would use that water for, for their cooking. 
So here we have, uh, you know, this gross negligence is not, it's not murder. It's not uh, murder, but it's, it's near murder. <laughs> so here we need someone to apologize. But the defendant's lawyer made clear that they would never apologize because the civil court does not ask for this. The civil action does not ask for this. Well, at least in, in these cases. And um, so there is no hope that the plaintiffs can get the company people coming in Taiwan and say, look, we are sorry for perhaps not themselves, but the former, uh, the former boss of the company, the former managers did, and we apologize on their behalf. Because if they do this in the US, it might cause a series of class actions. So the defendant's lawyer reject that possibility in an in a out of court settlement. So the, the, the solution will be necessarily in the shape of, of money, but we are looking for something that is almost like a, almost like a say, almost like an apology, a, a verbal apology. It's, I don't know if that's, does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, for some reasons, um, I cannot see who raised hand or not. So can other moderators see it in case I, I miss it? Because I, um, think, I think Paul will have to stop sharing the screen for you to see everybody, okay. right? Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Um, we have a comment or questions in the chat box. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Would you mind coming up onto the stage and you can turn, you can unmute yourself and introduce yourself and maybe maybe uh, make your comment or ask your question. It's quite lengthy. It's I, 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 I don't know. We, we use a real name in this seminar. So I, I would invite you to maybe introduce yourself so the speakers and the audience know you are. You are uh, Cheng Ling Lu from Jinan University. Okay. Um, if you are not in the position of turning on your camera or unmuting yourself, would you like me to read your question? Cheng, Cheng Ling. Okay. So Cheng Ling has a question comment for Paul. Um, he or she said, I, I don't know. So. Um, I I just noticed that the two cases you analyze are both quite recent, and I'm wondering if there are any similar cases back in the 20th century and how they were solved. Also, any difference in terms of lawsuits and the local authorities between the cases of the 20th and 21st century, given that Taiwan has been an industrialized region for many has been an industrialized region for many years. So that's uh, questions from Cheng, Cheng Ling Lu from Jin, Jinan University. Uh, Paul, could you unmute yourself? Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you very much. It's an interesting question. It's important to uh, indeed to that we look back in history and actually uh, if we think of the Anthropocene as a lot of debate on the Anthropocene has focused on when did it start? Was it in, in the uh, prehistoric times or during the Industrial Revolution? If the Industrial Revolution was it in England because of the steam machine and so on and so forth. So a lot of discussion in the Anthropocene has, 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 is, is about history. When did, when, when did it start? And, um, and of course, uh, the decision if, uh, of that geological time is, is it... Uh, is, is still undecided, right? So it's very important indeed to look back in history. And, I, and um, but here for 20th century or 19th century, I will think more easily about Japan, which has a long uh, history um, and now a, a rich literature on, on the cases of. Um, um, all kind of industrial pollution in Japan. Uh, Loretta kindly mentioned my previous work on Minamata disease in Japan. The in the case of Minamata disease, it's, um, uh, it has been uh, described sometimes as the 
the birthplace of industrial pollution or the ontology of birth of industrial pollution. Kogai no Genten, Minamata Bio. Uh, another case is Ashio. Uh, so Minamata is a case of murky pollution. So I let me, if you're not familiar, Minamata, I write in the chat. It's worth uh, taking a look at this case. Another interesting case in the case of Japan is Ashio copper mine pollution. Uh, those two cases are kind of very emblematic case of long uh, pollution that has effects on the very long term. In the case of Ashio, this copper, uh, it was a copper pollution uh, that affected the, uh, the rice paddies all over a, a large region. And it is still polluted nowadays. Even nowadays, the trees cannot grow there. Um, and it was, it started in, at the end of the 19th century. Now, um, recently because of uh, um, the 10, it was the 10 years of the Fukushima disaster, nuclear disaster. So we had a lot, uh, many conferences on, on, on Fukushima. Um, we don't see yet uh, um, very obvious effects on, on the, on, on the vegetation, on, on plants and trees in Fukushima uh, so far, but we already see some disturbance of, of, the, of the animals and uh, some cases of, uh, of um, thyroid cancers among humans. But in, we had a presentation by Kate Brown on the, I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's, have a book somewhere beyond. Kate Brown has, has, has conducted a, a magnificent work on Chernobyl, the pollution of Chernobyl. And, you know, although it's how many years? For 30 years, no, 40 years from now, 30 years from uh, 1986, yeah, more than 30 years. Um, we already see uh, long, what, what could be long-term effects. So sometimes we don't need to wait for a hundred years to see consequences on a large scale. So Paul, we have a lineup of questions. So if that's yes. okay with you, I'll take more questions and maybe yeah, you can come okay. back to the historical. Yeah. No, I, I was checking uh, this question um, because uh, there was another did I mention about the so we have Gonzalo, Brandon, uh, Raffaele. Yeah. Do, do I pronounce your name correctly? Anyway, um, so Gonzalo, Brandon, are your questions a comment or more of a, of a question? I want to think about how to organize them. Uh, questions. Mine sort of. Okay. Mine is sort of a, a comment slash observation. Uh, okay, Brandon, perhaps go first. Yeah. Okay, Brandon. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. I, I apologize too for coming in late. I had to put my son, I'm in Taiwan as well. I had to put my son to sleep. So I also came late and you may have, I, I missed the first few minutes, but um, I was especially uh, struck uh, in comparison to something I've been studying in mainland China for over a decade with land requisition, uh, what you talked about and, and Loretta brought it up in her, her question too, the sort of material morality between different types of of compensation or recognition of, of you know harms and so in studying land requisition for for hydropower for over a decade i've discovered this too that that just giving people money doesn't generate the same sort of response that that, that people who have been tied to the land as agriculturalists for such a long time and so it struck me how parallel that is actually i've never quite heard that in terms of industrial pollution consumption coming so close together. I mean, I, I actually dug up this quote here where someone was saying um, 300 per mu of, you know, 30,000 renminbi per mu plus 260 per month compensation for our rice fields will be given, but that's not enough. Without our land, we have no history. It won't be the same. We won't have and we'll lose uh, Xiao Kong, which I'm sure you're familiar with. That means, you know, small comfort in Chinese uh, sort of rhetoric. But the, the whole idea that there's different types of 
material morality and how you can compensate people. And in this case, the people I was working with just said that they didn't care how much money you gave them. It didn't, it doesn't matter that removing their material uh, home, literally where they live is, there's no amount of, of, of money that could ever possibly replace that. So I'm just curious if you could speak more, you know, a little bit to that. And if you see the parallel there, that too, because it's interesting to me that land in terms of industrial harm could actually be seen as quite a parallel I found when, as you were talking. So. Okay, before other ask the questions, um, I just throw in one angle is, um, you know, this tire uh, that in mainland China, this demolition after, after their houses got demolished, they got, uh, you know, a lot of money compensation. I mean, it's different from industrial disease and that sort of compensation. But I think it, uh, it threw in another angle about what money can do and how it can change the relationships about how money exactly. is perceived. Um, so right. the question is Gonzalo, and then uh, uh, sorry, how do how do how should I pronounce your name? Is Italian? Right? Raffaele or uh, Raffaele? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Gonzalo and then Raffaele. Okay, I I don't know if Paul wants to get back to Brandon or shall I just uh, do you want do you want I think to get if back you, to... you can keep your yeah. questions to sync yeah. and we can gather two questions and then Paul can maybe address them. Okay, yeah. Okay, so actually, one of my quick questions has to do with what Brendan just raised. I mean, I'm also a fan of uh, Viviana Zelizer, uh, her work on the social meanings of, of, of money, but I was struck on how much your presentation was actually about compensation, um, or at least as much about compensation as it is about, about money. And I would like you to push you a little bit more about telling us uh, about the social meanings of compensation. It wasn't exactly clear to me what was meant by, what was actually being compensated. Um, in some cases, uh, it, it seemed to be like personal losses. Uh, in other cases, there seemed to be other considerations of the kind that Brendan was talking about, uh, loss of life or loss of a linkage to, uh, to land. Uh, and I think this is uh, sort of important, given that you're trying to link this to questions of like, you know, big questions like the Anthropocene, of course. Uh, and, uh, you know, which begs the question of who is, who is speaking on behalf of, you know, the environment and, and, and issues like land in these in this legal, legal procedures. Uh, so that's, that's one question. I have another question, but I can keep it towards the end because it's a sort of more general question that has to do with the Anthropocene actually. So maybe I, it's better I try to answer this because this is this is the central aim of my actually this is my second attempt of, of addressing of trying to level up my interest for money and compensation uh, because you know for the last 20 years I've been working on 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 the cases of local cases of industrial pollution either in Japan or in Taiwan and uh, but i'm i'm reluctant to go global directly you know but the the interest with the anthropocene is, is something is, is something so big that we cannot ignore and now i've i kind of feel that i cannot just keep on doing those parochial cases of industrial pollution so to go directly to your question gonzalo which is uh, really central to me it's uh, is compensation, uh, well, compensation is money for sure. So uh, here the work of Zelizer is, is really helpful because it, it helped me to frame, uh, you know, to produce different kinds of compensation into different boxes, like similarly as she, had, she has done for different use of, of wages or different, uh, uh, you know. So here, here compensation is money. But there's another meaning for compensation, which is of course moral. Well, first of all, it's legal. So you have the legal definition of, for example, uh, I heard many times uh, people uh, saying that, sorry, it's, I, I have to go into Chinese, but it's Pei Chang and Pu Chang is not the same. Because in, in English, we just have compensation. In French, we have compensation and reparation. 
I don't know for Portuguese uh, reparação, so <laughs> if if that works. But you know, even in French, it it the the moral meaning of that is different. Uh, uh, for example, um, a colleague of mine in France have I've heard someone telling him, "This money will not repair us anything." So so you know it's so I think every language has as its uh, is is genius. It's it's it's. Uh, its capacity for expressing this moral and some and symbolic dimension. Uh, so, uh, but of course, what is compensated now? What is compensated? Sometimes it's the loss of life. Sometimes it's the loss of the place. Uh, not in just two cases in Taiwan, uh, but I'm thinking in, in Fukushima, uh, there's a, now a lot of class actions about uh, Furusato no Sanshitsu. It's literally the loss of the homeland. Um, so here it's it's uh, in the case of RCA and, and Formosa, which I presented today, is mostly for dead parents or cancers. And in the case of RCA, in addition to dead parents and cancer, we have a third group of other sicknesses, other uh, health problems. Uh, and we try to uh, the, the lawyers try to emphasize the psychological stress. So uh, they ask for a, a psychological compensation because of the stress of this time bomb. So it's, it's multi-purpose in that sense. So this multi-purpose of the compensation adds to the complexity of what do we mean by what, what is the moral and symbolism and, and symbolic of, of the of this of the request. Thank you. So I think next we have Rarali and Yi Chang. And um, um, to the audience, we may uh, run a little bit over time. So if you have other commitments, uh, you can leave now. But uh, we'll probably run maybe ten minutes. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Paul, for the. Excellent presentation. Um, I think, yeah, you brilliantly explained how compensation connects to so much more than, than just money and how there is a moral world that is also attached in a sense to, um, to, the, to the amount of money that is requested or received. I was just wondering um, how that compensation money, especially when it comes to compensating death, um, you were using the term dirty money at some point. I'm not sure if related to, to um, that type of compensation. But I was wondering how uh, the plaintiffs use that money afterwards um, because compensation connects to you know, a moral economy or a morality or a moral world. Um, is there a moral imperative attached to that money? Um, and so how does it move forward? How, what, what purposes does it, ser does it serve? Can it, can it be spent in, in certain ways as opposed to others? Um, do people feel that they should invest it in a meaningful way as opposed to um, sum it up to, to um, the money that they already have? And yeah, I was just wondering how that expands and what does that add to our understanding of um, the moral economy around pollutants and, and litigations. Yi Cheng, if you can quickly. Yes, uh, just a brief comment, because I was uh, you know, also a kind of money scholar and I was recently writing my dissertation. And one of the quite influential uh, piece of work in my dissertation is, um, you know, a money philosopher called Mark Kokelberg who wrote the book called Money Machines. And, and from a kind of a philosophy perspective or maybe a philosophy plus STS perspective, money could be also viewed as a technology uh, as it kind of uh, promises a lot of, you know, the, the, the bridging of distance uh, as a medium. And also it kind of causes a paradox of distancing at different levels. So you kind of promise the distance with them, you know, bridged with the market, but then you, you created moral distances from, from people uh, 
to the earth or between people. So, so I was wondering maybe, you know, if we're framing this from an STS perspective and we are trying to say, uh, like link uh, Anthropocene with money and maybe I think distancing and also, uh, you know, the, the, the understanding of money as a technology itself could be very helpful. Many thanks, I, It's the first time I hear this book. Can you write the author's name in the chat? I'd be yeah, happy yeah, yeah. To... I'll, I'll just uh, post it. It's fascinating. I didn't know that. It's it's I I, I need that. Prop... That's perhaps the, the piece of the puzzle I need to uh, level up my approach of the money in the, in the Anthropocene. Yeah, it's definitely uh, disciples of Zilitzer have. Uh, um, I think two or three years ago, published an interesting book called uh, Money Talks, I think, with, uh, yeah, Money Talks, uh, and uh, explaining how money really works, uh, Nina Bandelj. It's, it's, um, some of, it's a collective book, and remember that some book chapters uh, inside in this book uh, had this this app this sort of approach, and uh, but you know what it, it immediately comes to my mind when speaking of money as a technology is of course uh, uh, this, uh, how China is using uh, credit card to control people now. It's it's I mean the most uh, obvious uh, use of money as a technology a technology of control. So it's it's bio capital at uh, uh, 2.0, it's, it's, it's uh, the, an extreme uh, way of, of biocapitalism. Um, and, 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 and to turn money into uh, um, But yeah, it's, it's, this is where, um, okay, maybe I, I, I can go to uh, Raphael's question about what is the purpose uh, of, of this uh, search for money as a moral? I don't think there is a, a, a moral imperative in terms of uh, like a Kantian category. Uh, it, it, there is no imperative. I think, um, and here I noted differences between the, uh, the case of RCA and, and, and Formosa Plastic. For, in the case of R of RCA, uh, it's a foreign company, American company, which has closed the doors, they left, left the country. So here the moral, yeah, moral, uh, the moral relation to money uh, is very different because uh, the company is no more there. So in the case of Formosa Plastic, the company is still there. So it still has a huge economic influence on, on the country. So for RCA, we cannot redress the behavior of that company. We can only, uh, we can only influence the behavior of other company in, in a similar situation, like other electronic companies in Taiwan. You know that Taiwan is a very, is, a, is in, at a, uh, has a lot of semiconductor uh, plants and it has a, a leading uh, role globally uh, like TSMC. So this action on RCA has a moral goal for other electronic workers or other uh, computer industry. While in the case of Formosa, it's the company itself, it's still, it's still there. So it's important. Uh, I think one of the goal is to change the attitude of that company regarding the fence line communities in Taiwan. And now we have a global movement against uh, um, what Formosa is, uh, plastic the, 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 is project in Louisiana, Texas, in Vietnam. So we have an international coalition against Formosa plastic. So, you know, depending on the situation of the company, depend of the, the, the polluter, depending on the, on the, if we are talking about dead parents or uh, people who are still alive, uh, struggling with, with cancer or other sickness, the morals uh, search would be very different. Does that answer your question, Rafael? 
Yes, thank you so much. Okay, so absolutely the last question from Wei Gong, if you can keep it succinct and briefly introduce yourself. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, thanks, um, Professor. I'm, I'm Wei, I'm at Princeton, um, and for a grad student. And I have a really short question. So I was wondering um, if activists or act advocacy organizations play a role in, in litigating these cases or helping out their plaintiffs. And then if so, um, what do you think is the role of money in kind of funding these secondary organizations and then by proxy funding the plaintiffs and funding justice? Yes, definitely. Uh, in, in, in the two cases I presented today, we have uh, different organization, but um, you know, Taiwan is a small country, so most of them are interrelated. Uh, in the case of RCA, um, activists are mostly labor activists, uh, meaning that uh, people who have been fighting against, uh, fighting for the recognition of occupational injuries and sicknesses, uh, it's called RC, uh, sorry, Gongshan uh, Xiehui, and the English name is Tavoy. Taiwan Association for the Victim of Occupational Injuries, in Chinese, Gongshan Xiehui. It's uh, one of the older organization. It was founded in 1995. So their first struggle was for the victims of silicosis. I think there were similar struggles in, in Hong Kong, Shenzhen and Southern China about the same time. Um, and they are connected actually uh, to, to uh, organization in China and other Asian countries. Um, in the case of Formosa Plastic, most of them are uh, environmental groups like Zhonghua, uh, Huanbao uh, Lianmang, Taiwan Lusu Lianmang, the Green Citizen, uh, Citizen Alliance, the Environmental Rights Foundation, uh, Environmental Jurist Association, this kind of organization. So uh, some of them are uh, based in Taipei and others are based in Zhonghua, Yulin, and Kaohsiung. But altogether, they have launched a, a citizen platform to of its a citizen surveillance uh, platform to look on the uh, corporate uh, behavior of uh, Formosa Plastic. And now they are um, connected to a similar organization in, in Southern US. I mentioned Texas and Louisiana, and also they are supporting the Vietnamese plaintiffs in the case of the of the marine pollution in Vietnam. So they are their role is very important, very important. Okay, I think Gonzalo may have a very last question, but Paul, you have to keep it short. Your response, okay? Uh, Gonzalo, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so I would like to go back to the Anthropocene poll because, you know, I thought it was fascinating the way that you were bringing together two very different sets of concerns. Like you start with the Anthropocene and, and with Hornberg and his critique of general purpose money and the call to reorient society about, around a, a different way of organizing how money works. And then you give us some case studies about how actually uh, money works in cases of compensation and sort of industrial uh, litigation and so on. And I was fascinated by your diagrams in which you kind of um, bring in two orders of valuation, right? The symbolic and the economic order of valuation. And so as I was looking at your diagrams, I was kind of thinking to myself, so where does the Anthropocene fits into your diagrams, right? And I suppose that people like Hornborg would talk about something like a planetary order evaluation, right? So they would probably add another layer to your diagrams to, you know, to think about, you know, how is, I suppose, the environment and the planet writ large being evaluated in these claims and who is speaking for those issues, right? And so I suppose my question is, so if you added uh, this planetary order evaluation to your diagrams, 
uh, would there be anyone speaking for the planet in these compensation legal suits? Wow, <laughs> yeah. this is a great question. Uh, that's gonna be hard to answer in one minute. You can take uh, it also as a comment. Yes, I think I will bring it back home <laughs> and meditate. I think it's a great, great way to, uh, for sure, the, 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 the difference between sim, I mean, if you think of, okay, let's bring the, let's bring the animals, let's bring the non-humans in, 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 in this diagram, where we, where we, where we put them. Animals don't care for morals and symbols, right? It's so, it's, it's so, it's, this way of framing things is so anthropic, so so much so so much human. I mean, so I'm I'm still uh, I haven't reached that Naturian uh, stage of uh, you know very uh, um, bringing the non-humans in it. I mean, it's not that I don't care. That's but. Um, that's why I, I, I bring the oysters in. You remember that when yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. mentioned about the oysters compared to the cancers? You know what struck me with the, with the oyster? Uh, the ladies who, who, who mentioned that are uh, oyster farmers. So they, they do care a lot about oyster. But I, I mean, they don't have like this intimate relation with oysters, but near, near, near to. It's, it's uh, so... Um, uh, I mean, it's like, you know, um, you can think of this famous article by Calon, uh, but the scallops and, and you know, in, in, of Saint-Brieuc. It's, um, I think the way people treat their source of life and living um, in, in Japan, now one of these class actions is called Nariwai Social. Nariwai means the source of living. It is also the place of living. So it's, it's the furusato, it's the, it's, it's the homeland, and it's, it's the source of living. So there is a place where, um, because of our ontology, uh, as Descola put it, we, we are, it's very hard to become, uh, I mean, an aboriginal to, <laughs> way of thinking, you know, to get rid of our uh, natural on, uh, ontology. We are so stick to it. So for me, it's um, looking at money, how people in those local issues look, look at general purpose money. It's a way to connect. So here, maybe that's the big difference with Hornborg. You know, Hornborg just prefers to imagine how uh, we can get rid of general purpose money. And I, I look at how local people look at general purpose money, not, not necessarily as a solution for the Anthropocene, of course not, that's not very far away from their mind. But I think it can give us a few insights about how we can go step by step from those local issues. You know, it's always the problem of connecting and the local and the global and, yes. and, and, and here I, I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, I completely follow on, La, on Latour with uh, very reluctant to uh, use this representation of the globe i'm not global but, so that's but the local is not is not such is 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 not satisfying either because uh so this this opposition between local and global is it's it's wrong if it drives us to make this kind of of distinction i'm sorry i'm i'm trying to think with you but the answer but thanks very much for the question i think i it's, thank you. Thank you. It's, yeah. It was fascinating. Take it back home. Take it back home. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, so I think we have to, we are <laughs> quite over, overrun now, but um, I think we have a very good discussion at the Q&A session. I, and I hope that uh, Paul, you find it uh, useful for formulating your new paper. And I've also seen that we have some new friends joining us today from Taiwan. So if you have not followed our Facebook, um, or other social media outlets, please uh, uh, follow them or sign or sign up to be on our mailing list. Um, we put 
uh, all rec the recording of each seminar online, both this Scientech Asia seminar and also the pluralizing Anthropocene uh, on our social media outlets. And so please spread the word. And if you would like to give a talk and you can give me, uh, Yi Cheng or Gonzalo an email. So thank you very much for uh, spending your evening or afternoon uh, with us today, I I feel like we are just we've just start opening some new, you know, avenues of discussions about money and anthropocene. But we have to stop here today. But um, I'll see you guys maybe in two weeks time um, for our next Science Asia. Gonzalo and Yichen, if you have any, do you have anything to add? Just to thank you so much, Loretta, for moderating this session. Yeah, thank oh, no, you. Sorry uh, for, for, you know, yeah. what's happened, the engineering work in my house, but thank you. And I'll hope uh, have a good evening, afternoon. Uh, see you guys later. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.